Good morning, finally. This will be, this is number four. So this meeting was scheduled the fall of 2020, postponed, and then it was scheduled, I think, later, maybe the spring, early summer of 21, because of COVID. And then we decided late, maybe that year, and then amazingly, two groups decided to come together. And decided that wouldn't be the best time for the meeting, so it was canceled then, postponed again. i have basically kind of given up on it. But uh, I'll tell you a little bit of this. I don't want to scare you off, but I'll tell you about Sunday, Betsy wasn't feeling very well. Monday, I wasn't feeling very well. She had a little bit of a fever. I started coughing a little bit. And so she tested Monday, was negative. Wednesday, I went and got a test just before Bible class. And I said, if this comes back positive, I'm going to conclude that this meeting was never supposed to happen. Thankfully, it did not. If I'm coughing a little bit, it's allergies, things down in my throat. <clears throat> so, you know, early in 2020, if you went in a restaurant and started coughing and sneezing, you had the restaurant to yourself. But uh, anyway, I'm tired of it, and I know you are too, and I hear you're doing well. Um, I'm refreshed by the idea of two groups deciding they want to work together and making that work, and that's refreshing to me. And obviously, there are a number of you that I know from the years that Betsy and I were at Helton Drive. And it's good to see you work together. And I know I held a couple of meetings at River Bend. If you don't remember any of that, that's okay. Uh, but I enjoyed that. Uh, just very thankful to be here today and spend the week together. You don't plant a garden and work it around a meeting. It's been a tradition at Betsy's mom and dad's to plant about 12 rows of sweet corn, 120 feet long, and two rows of beans. And the beans and corn decided, we're going to be ready this week. I picked beans, and she put up about 21 quarts Friday morning. I come in the house, and I brought two or three cobs that I'd just taken off the stalk. And I said, do you want to look at this? And she said, oh, no. She said, are you kidding me? Are you telling me? I have to stay here? <laughs> I said, yeah, we've worked pretty hard on this 12 rows of corn to get it ready. And it ain't waiting. And the worst part is the picker and the shucker are standing right here. So she's going to have to rally the troops. Her dad's 87. So he's a little bit of help. But, uh, there was nobody more disappointed if you saw the look on her face Friday morning when I brought in that corn. She said, I just, that's the first thing she thought about. I'm not going to be able to go to Florence. So. And I miss her being here too. You would have enjoyed being with her. I've left a couple of groups and had people tell me as I left, we will miss Betsy. Um, and that's pretty true to form. All right. I don't know if this will be an unusual lesson to begin a gospel meeting with. Turn it on will help. Um. But I want to be helpful, and I want to be helpful in all of the things that we study about this week and think about together. Something happened to probably about seven years ago that probably got me thinking about this more, and I began reading some things. I have read where people, Christians, have said baptism is a Church of Christ tradition. Along with eating the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, taking up a contribution, the way we do it, just a tradition of churches of Christ, instrumental music, the roles of women in assemblies. A friend of mine held a meeting in Indianapolis a couple of years ago, and one of the deacons said he thought the silence of the scriptures was just a tradition of churches of Christ. And of course, and it's been several years, the whole idea of command, example, necessary inference as a way of interpreting and applying Scripture, that also was just something that was concocted in the minds of preachers and others and is just one of our other traditions. So I decided we need to work through some of that and try to help each other, and particularly a younger generation who likes to question things. And that's not bad. 
A Christian told me that she was in a church and there were folks coming to her talking about changing things. We just need to change. And she asked why. She said, we just need change. Well, may I first begin today by saying that's a poor reason to change anything. Just because we think change would be good. And on the other side, there is a, we can be so rigid about some things that any change at all would be viewed as a step in the direction of apostasy. And so I have, in my ex limited experience, seen what I think is almost a tug of war. And I don't mean for it to be an older, younger generation issue, but sometimes it is not always, where you've got one side that's hanging on this rope and we're not going to give and the other side not going to give and so we're just, we're not being helpful to each other. We also realize that we have come to perhaps a time in which we like to question things and that's, I don't suggest that's new to us. I want to say something very clearly, that it is okay to have questions. It is especially okay for our children to raise questions about why we do the things we do. Do you want your children following Jesus just because you do? I don't. I want to be a positive influence. But at some point, I want them to have their own convictions. It's got to be their faith. And I need to be able to explain to them soundly and kindly and patiently, here's why we do what we do, and particularly when it comes to the things we do together. You know, years ago, a 16-year-old, one of our members, gave me a piece of paper, and, she, and the question was, do you think God cares whether or not we use instrumental music? That's not a time to panic. That's not a time to think, have my kids not been listening to anything for 16 years? Because now they're growing up and their minds are beginning to work and they want to know why. Give me a sound biblical answer why we don't use instrumental music. And also, if we're out working like you all do, and talking to people, and we're teaching folks who didn't grow up in churches of Christ, like I did, who don't know the terminology. I can say command, example, necessary inference, and they look at you like, what is that? Or institutionalism or other things like that, and they don't, they're not familiar with terms we become very comfortable with. Then I need to be able to explain to them too. And do so with meekness and respect. What I have seen, and I was part of a, an experience, a very unpleasant, where a question had been raised, and we didn't have elders, and so a business meeting arrangement. And it was supposed to have been a Bible study, but it turned out to be anything but, because we just got wrong attitudes. We haven't put away clamoring from ourselves, as Paul teaches us in Ephesians 4, and that's loud quarreling. Where we're not able to sit down patiently, respectfully, and with meekness, say, here's why I believe what I believe. Be ready to give a defense of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3.15. So you've got to be able to do that. So there's, there's a balance here, and I'm going to hopefully try today to find some of that balance as we work through some of the questions that we have to work through. The one experience, one experience I had, I remember I was not teaching the Bible class, but one man said, I'm hearing way too much about traditions. So I decided then we need to study about it. Traditions is a biblical word. So what's the first thing you think about when you think tradition? Now, typically we're thinking about the way we've done things. Maybe even, there's some good traditions. Does your, does your family have traditions? 
You know, I, I knew better to show up at Christmas time at my mom and dad's house without a dozen roses. Because if I didn't have them, my mom was going to say, you can come back when you got them. And that's all she wanted. I don't care about anything else, but just make sure her son brought her a dozen roses to have on the table during the holidays. That's a tradition. And I had, you know, I didn't break that tradition. So there are good things, and that's what we, things have been handed down. You've heard this old illustration, surely, and if a younger generation has it, you know, there's the story of the lady was visiting a friend and she was getting ready to cook a, a ham. You can put in there whatever you want for the story. She's getting ready to cook a ham and going to put it in the oven that morning and she cut the end of the ham off and put it in the pan and put it in the oven. And her friend said, well, why'd you do that? She said, that's what my mom used to do. Well, he called her mom. <clears throat> mom, friend here wants to know why you cut the end of the, ha ham off, well, the, end of the ham off. And she said, well, that's what your, your grandmother used to do. And grandma's still living. So she called grandma that. And grandma had to kind of, you know, for a moment slowly and said, grandma, why did, why did you cut the end of the ham off before you put it in the pan, put it in the oven? And grandma just thought for a minute and then she started chuckling. She said, well, child, back in the day I had one pan, it was only this long. So I had to cut the ham off to get it in the pan. You know, it, it wasn't some great cooking idea that made the ham any better. And so that's how things get handed down. And that's okay. That's life. How many of you like SEC football? Don't raise your hands because everybody, you know. I lived here for five years. I got my taste of that. But there are traditions. There are just things you do. That's okay. Tradition is a biblical word. And it just simply by itself means something that's been handed down from this person to this person. And it can be verbal or in writing. And that's what the word means. And Paul uses the word, in fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 11. He begins this chapter, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions as I delivered them to you. That same word is used over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's another one I'm looking for too. The other one's in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which were, you were taught, whether by word or epistle. Traditions. And then back in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians in verse 23, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered. You actually have the idea of tradition in that one passage. Received, delivered. And the word delivered really is a, a, a basic root, the word here used for tradition. So it's been handed down to me. Jesus gave it to me. I'm giving it to you. So the Bible, the New Testament, are the traditions of God, the will of God, the word of God, handed down, delivered to the apostles so that they could write them down for us and we could now know the will of the Lord. It's the teaching of the apostles. It's the apostles' doctrine that that first group of Christians said, they con continued in that steadfastly, Acts chapter 2. That's why they met with the apostles daily in the temple in those early days because the, they didn't have the New Testament. Open it up and read it today. The apostles were given the word and they were presenting the word to them. So they were eagerly listening. What did the apostles have to say? Jesus promised the apostles, the spirit will come on you. And he will guide you into all truth. First, uh, John 13, not first, John 13. In John 14, he will remind you of things that I told you. So when we read the Bible, we're reading the word of God as God delivered it to men and has been given down and we still read it following the traditions of God. So it's a perfectly good word 
to use in some context. But I would suppose that this is the one we think of the most because it is the times in which Jesus had his confrontations with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees had their traditions of the elders. Some of those traditions were okay. Washing your hands before you eat. We've done a whole lot of that the last couple of years. Washing our hands was not a wrong thing. But, and if I understand correctly, they made it kind of ceremonial and they went through a process of basically making sure everything from the elbow to the tips of their fingers had been washed. But they made it to the point where it was a law. You had to do that. And the, he saw, they saw the apostles not washing their hands before they eat, and they were already condemned them of sinning. And they weren't sinning at all. They maybe made that law because they wanted to make sure they didn't have anything unclean on them before they grabbed a piece of bread and put it in their mouth. And Jesus said, that you do a lot of that. He said, the worst thing sometimes is your traditions cause you to lay aside the word of God. You've got some extra money. You say, I'm going to give this to the work of the temple. Okay, you, you can free will offer if you want to do that. But mom and dad have gotten older. And mom and dad have got some financial needs. And the next thing you know, you need to help them. And you go to mom and dad and say, I'm sorry, dad. I had some extra money, but I contributed it to the work of the temple. And so I don't have any money to help you. And Jesus said, you laid aside the word of God to keep your tradition. That happens a lot in our world. I wonder if what we've done and what I get a sense of is that we need to apply these to ourselves. I agree. We need to be able to patiently look at the, why we do the things we do. And if it's just a tradition, if it's a tradition, though, it's a laying aside the word of God, then it certainly needs to be changed. But in applying ourselves, have we forgotten how full this world is, the religious world with the traditions of men? It's almost like I got the, the sense from some that we're just, we're offended by any teaching and preaching that might make an effort to expose any of that or simply do what Jesus did. Here's the word of God. Here's the traditions of men. We can do that and we ought to be able to do that. And it help, will help some honest people to see the truth. We're not trying to offend people by pointing out that this is false. There's false teaching in the world, and a lot of it. A priest in Phoenix, Arizona, all the baptisms that he had performed, and but all of those had been determined. And the reason they were invalid is because he hadn't said the right. Instead of saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, he said, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to read to you what the, the bishop in that area said about this practice. By the way, I'm, the brief explanation of why I and we, I, meaning Christ in me is baptizing them. I don't even agree with that. We, the community, the church baptizes you, and so they've come up with this idea that you had to say just, you had to say just the right thing. And because they didn't, the, the one said, it is my duty to ensure that the sacraments are conferred in a manner that is in keeping with the commands of Jesus Christ in the gospel and the requirements of sacred tradition. And I've learned that. Somebody gave me a book recently. Uh, this lady wrote a, a book. I love the title of it. Maybe you've heard of it. From a nun to a priest. It's about her becoming a Christian after being a member of a convent for a number of years. Um, it's her, her first book is A Change of Habit. And I read that book. It wasn't very long. And she just, the thing that came to, in her mind, eventually was all the traditions of the Catholic Church. And she looked at her Bible, and she said, this is not in Scripture. 
So we're going to patiently, kindly, lovingly help people see that. And respect and meekness must be seen. We'll lose our young people. Catholicism has influenced the teaching of the world. And then the Reformation period and Martin Luther and John Calvin. Calvinism is still very much a part of the thinking of a lot of religious people. Now, let me say something very quickly. When you sit down with someone to teach them and you find out this is the church they go to, don't assume they believe everything you think they, they believe. Just be willing to listen and study with them and help them just show the scriptures. One of the easiest Bible studies I ever had, trying to teach them and uh, dear lady, she needed to be baptized for the remission of her sins. I asked her, what did you do to become a Christian? And I had a whiteboard back in the day. Imagine that. I take care of a whiteboard around. And I wrote on the whiteboard, I said, okay, you said, I believed, I was saved, and I was baptized. Then I was baptized. And she said, yeah, that, that's true. That's what I did. I said, well, let me just write this down. And let's look at what the passage says. Those that believe and are baptized are then saved. I said, do you see the difference? She said, yeah, I sure do. I need to be baptized. <laughs> That's the easiest Bible study I've ever had. We went to the building and she was immersed for the remission of her sins because she realized she had never done that. And that's what we need to do with folks. Just kindly and patiently say, here's what the scriptures teach and verse the traditions that they have been bound with. Now, thirdly, and this is the area we wrestle with, our expedience. I have a quarter after, right? Is that correct? Quarter after 10? And I can't see that clock. How much time I got? Anyway, wave your hand at me when I got five minutes. Am I good? Was it about five till? There will be a bell. I can't hear and I can't see. So, <laughs> you know. I can see this, but I got long distance glasses, but then I can't read. So, anyway, expedience or judgments that we use in carrying out commands. I mean, there are things we do, like PowerPoint. Where's the authority for this? I've never read about PowerPoint in Scripture. Bobby Graham says, I use PowerPoint. The power's in the gospel, and I make points using the gospel. Anyway, that's Bobby Graham. Songbooks, where's the authority for songbooks? You know, there are a number of things that we use. Where's the authority for a building? We'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, <clears throat> they're expedients in carrying out. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 12, and I don't think we misuse this passage. It's an interesting context. I don't think we use it very often in the context in which it's found. But I think the principle is this. All things are lawful for me. Now, by the way, stop. He didn't say everything. I can do whatever I want. He said, everything I choose to do is lawful. That's first. Is what, am I, is what I'm doing lawful? Is it right? Is it what God expects me to do? But all things aren't helpful or expedient. There may be some things that are lawful to do, but they may not, may not be helpful at all. And so those are times when we need to make certain choices. For example, the order in which we do things in the assemblies. Now, I've been in places where people say, well, let's just change the order. I didn't have this in my notes, but let me tell you about a young preacher who decided that we need to change the order of eating the Lord's Supper and the preaching. And the Lord's Supper was after the preaching. I thought, well, let's move it before, and maybe that'll help us think about it better and I just thought, just, I, I just said I, and I didn't mean for you to hear that, but I was going to tell you anyway. You know, this 25-year-old preacher that thought that that was going to help things. I got at elders, and I was telling the elders that, and I started to fight an argument between two of the elders. And I thought, later on, I thought, that was just the dumbest thing you've ever done, Lee. You know, like, that's going to change things? That's going to make me think better? about what I'm doing when I eat the Lord's Supper just because I rearrange things. But if you decide to do that, that's fine. It's not a sign. You know, their brethren just won't, you know, not going to change that. And then there are others who, you know, maybe, maybe that could be a good thing. How about Bible classes on Sunday evening? I think Nick visited a congregation once, and he called me up. And he said, Lee, or Dad, I got to worship on Sunday night, and I got there. You know, they had Bible classes. And I said, yeah. 
Well, that's just weird, Dad. Yeah, it's weird because that's not what you've always done all your life, but it's okay. It's okay. How often we meet. That's a subject we're dealing with. We're dealing with it where I am. Got a number of folks that are already, you know, when the elders said leave, you know, I've got folks come to me and talking about, can we go to one service on Sunday? And, and I don't have time to look at all the things I have in my notes or all the subjects to look at, I want to look at. But I am asking the question, what's my motivation? If a church decides to meet one on Sunday, I don't look at that group thinking they're just falling away. They're, they're departing from the faith. They may have some good, sound reasons for doing that. Sunday night and Wednesday night are traditions. Um, get into my first point. But when we think about these things, and I'm, let me go ahead and get into the next points because I think I'll do a better job maybe explaining some of this and showing the contrast. Here's what I want to do. I got five things here. And I want to take these and show here's what God said, what I believe God said. Here's what men sometimes say. And then here are just some expedients in which to carry these commands out. Would any of us say that we're not commanded to assemble together? Certainly we wouldn't. Hebrews 10, 25 is a clear passage that talks about we ought not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Acts 20 and verse 7, the disciples at Troas came together to break bread. In 1 Corinthians 16, Paul's reference to them being together and taking up a collection on the first day of the week. Even withdrawing from a brother, it stated, when you come together, 1 Corinthians 5 verse 4. Paul in Acts 14 called the church and brought them together to give them a report of the work he had done on his first preaching trip. So we ought to be together. I mentioned Acts 2, that the early days of the, that, that church, the Christians in Jerusalem, they met every day. I'm not reckoning, you know, what, what if we suggested that? But that ain't going to work. It's not going to work. But <clears throat> we do know that we are to come together to eat the Lord's Supper together. What about these other times? What about this week? Yeah, I understand. I don't, know who, I don't even know who started the Wednesday night. That just seemed like a good thing to me. I'd hate to see us not do it. The little group Betsy grew up meeting with in the country, they meet on Sunday morning. That's the only time they meet anymore. They've kind of dwindled down to a certain number. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think 30 people could worship together as well as 130 were worshiping together 20 or 30 years ago. That's just what they decided to do. So those are, can we have good traditions? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with meeting Sunday night, nothing wrong with meeting Wednesday or Monday, and even the time of day in which we meet. All of those are matters of expediency. And where, where should we meet? Does it have to be an upper room? Does it have to be on the third floor? I read an article years ago, I can't find it where somebody found about a group that some, some of the place in the world that they read that passage, and so they built a building and had three floors. <laughs> and they met on the third floor. <clears throat> if I went there, I probably wouldn't say a word about it unless they come to me and said, we have to meet on the third floor to be right with God. Uh, wait a minute, time out. You know, there are things that are part of the story that aren't, they're incidental to the story. Where do we meet? Home, school. I, I'm hearing some brethren. I had one young man about 10 years ago said, I just wish all of our buildings would burn down. You know, he's kind of got caught up in this. We just need to change things. And uh, he's now meeting with a big group that has a building. So he hadn't given that up. Did we, can we meet in a school? You know, they, they did that in Acts chapter 19. Uh, and I've heard some advocate. I think there's a book written by a fairly well-known guy that was popular with some folks about traditions and changing things. Um, and he was advocating that the early Christians met in their homes. Well, I think sometimes they did. But I don't think it's the only time. I think the church met at the school of Tyrannus in Acts 19. 
So, and what do we do? Do we rent? Do we own? How much do we pay? Those, those are issues that come up. But we need to understand there are judgments involved. And God help us if we begin to divide over expedience. We shouldn't do that. Lord's Supper. Traditions of God handed down. Jesus teaching the apostles, do this. Paul teaching a church at Corinth what Jesus had given him. He wasn't there with them that night. And so they ate the Lord's Supper. It's fruit of the vine. I believe there's a necessary implication in the New Testament. It was fruit from, from grapes. Unleavened bread. You know, it, it never states specifically that it's supposed to be unleavened bread. But that's what they were using during the Passover. What do we have to? I know that I am pleasing my Father when I use the things that Jesus used when he taught the apostles about the Lord's Supper. First day of the week. I taught this a while back. and One fellow came up to me and said, show me the passage that says we can't do it any other time in regards to the contribution. I think I was so surprised by that that I didn't, at that point, I'm going to get around to it, ask him, what does he think about the Lord's Supper? I, I wish we had more than Acts 20 and verse 7. I could wish all day long that we had another passage that said anything about anybody eating the Lord's Supper on a particular day. And I know the arguments that we try to build up and try to show that this is the Lord's day, and the day to do that. But that's the day I, I can know. I believe I can know. And I'm pleasing God when I do this together with you today. In an assembly of a local church, I think it's supposed to be in the assembly. We're supposed to come together. Traditions of men, the members only eat the bread. That true in the Catholic church and maybe some others. Eat only on special occasions. Don't eat it regularly first day of the week. I know of one church uh, up the road here a few couple, three hours that uh, was meeting and they, they decided to have smaller groups. They were meeting, I think, in a gym and they set up tables. And so they had a group here, a group here, a group here. And when they ate, everybody was describing what it meant to them. They were doing some teaching about it, including the women. And so now you've got the women also instructing it seems to me the Bible says something about a woman's role when we come together in an assembly like this. And then here's another one. This, and this is, you know, the same guy that thinks we ought to be meeting in our homes suggested that it's a, it can be a part of a common meal. So you just sit down, I invite you over, we're eating mashed potatoes and green beans and corn and whatever. I got green beans and corn stuck in my head. But anyway, we can eat that. And then about halfway through, I'll tell you what, y'all, let's just stop. And let's eat some unleavened bread, drink some grape juice, and let's think about what Jesus did for us. First of all, the Passover was not a common meal. Specific to remind them of a very specific event. And they ate things there they didn't have to eat in every common meal. 1 Corinthians 11, if, if that passage says anything, it does say, and I realize somebody said, well, maybe they were meeting in their homes. Okay, I don't know what the church, that, that may be implied there the church of Corinth was not meeting in somebody's home. But nevertheless, Paul said, you know, this meal that you're making this, you do that at your house. That's different. Keep that distinct. It's not a physical meal. It's not meant to satisfy the flesh. It's a time to remember the most remarkable sacrifice, the giving of one cell that anybody's ever made so that I could go to heaven. Expedience, number of containers. Now, guess what? Not everybody agree with that. I grew up in southern Indiana. We had churches that just used one cup. Actually, I'm told they used three until the controversy over this, and then they went to one. What time of the day, the amount, the amount we eat. So I picked up, because we still do it, 
I, I picked up one of the things in the back because I thought that's how you were doing it. And uh, I've had people refer to us as pinch and sippers. And I got to move ahead here, but is how much we eat directly proportionate to how well you think? You know, if, if I come back here in 10 years and you all got a pretty good sized piece of bread and you got a big cup of fruit of the vine, okay, fine. Are you doing that because it gives you more time to think? That's been part of the issue. We have to tell our guys because we're doing back the, the still the little cups. When you give thanks, sit down and give us time to think. Because usually, you know, in a group like this, you pass it around. You've got that time. And I haven't done this in two and a half years, so I'm looking forward to that. But I think, you know, we can have opinions about these things. I understand that. Um, you know, somebody asked a question, could we do it this way? Uh, why not? Contribution. My lands. I got three other things. I got five minutes. Contribution. This, this one is interesting to think about. What traditions is the Lord handed down to us the first day of the week? Every member gives us their prospered. There's no set amount. It is for the needs of the saints. Got people where I am raising that question. Part of it because of the influence of others. Is it just for Christians? And I just did a lesson. And I went through all the passages that I find where the contribution is for the saints, 1 Corinthians 16, Romans 15, Paul was taking the funds that he was urging the Corinthians and the Galatians and others to be a part of. The Macedonians were a part of that. 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9, he's talking about the ministering to the needs of the saints. And then the questions come up, but can we use the contribution we're going to have collect today to help people that are not Christians? There are other ways of helping them. First of all, individuals. But my answer to that is, I don't think there's any authority for that. In the New Testament, a church sent to another church to take care of those needy saints. We just sent money to a church in eastern Kentucky to help a family that lost everything they had in this recent floods. And when you support gospel, you send money directly to the preacher. You don't send it to this church, and then they send it to the preachers. When I was in Nashville, Lipscomb sent us a letter asking us to contribute to their mission fund as they were sending young people out to preach the gospel. And wonder why we still talk about missionary societies, like that's old arguments, you know. But now society, we send money to the college. The college then sends the kids out. I haven't read that in Scripture. So there are things we're doing that churches do using their money that I believe, and as you know as well as I do, living here in, in Florence, those questions come up. I'm going to deal with one expedient on two expedients. Should we have a treasury? I'm hearing that. People ask, so where's our authority for a treasury? Okay, and this is where i got to be patient. And make sure I got it right. Paul told the Corinthians to start taking up a contribution. When he writes 2 Corinthians, it had been a year since he'd given the instructions in 1 Corinthians 16. In the second letter, he's urging them, go ahead. Now it's time to take some of those funds. And, and I'm, we're sending men that way. And they're going to collect the funds. And we're going to take them to church. It's been a year since he had taught them to take up a collection every first day of the week. Where did they put it? I don't know. In a box somewhere? Under somebody's mattress? I don't know. Or a bank back then, they had banks. You know, did they collect it? That's what a treasure is, just where you collect it, where it's put, put aside until we need it, until we can help a needy saint or we can support those who preach and teach the gospel. Does it have to be during an assembly? Now, I knew of a congregation before the pandemic that had a box sitting in, in the vestibule that people put their money in the box before they came in. I don't have a problem with that. And I hope that doesn't mean that's the end of this meeting. 
That'd be okay. Is it okay to do it in the assembly? I can talk about all kinds of opinions all day long. I'm actually going to skip over. If you want to talk about that, I'll study with you because that is the question that got me thinking about traditions, and that is what is the sign got to say? What if you're preaching in Boston with the Boston movement still very much alive in the hearts of people in Boston from the issues that are around that group and uh, the 2020 episode where people were interviewed being part of that group. And it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth. And we were helping support a guy up there. And I, we met with them once. And they had a little portable sign. They met in a hotel in a room over the side and a conference room of some kind. And they put a sign up that said, Saints in Boston meet here. And some of my brethren found out about that. And they decided we weren't going to support him anymore. And that's probably a time in my life that I thought I was really going to have to deal with some questions like Jesus dealt with the Pharisees. There isn't one description in the New Testament that we have to use, just one. I'm so glad I saw this back there. I'm not going to be able to find it in here, but I can. I should have looked it up. And it may, this may have been revised, but there was, we, had a tra- we had a track where I was, and in that track it said, you know, here are the number of ways that we could describe ourselves as a local congregation. And yet, because they didn't use the Church of Christ as a designation on that portable sign, and I said, guys, we got a track back here in the track rack that says we can use these others too, like saints at Ephesus. Last one, baptism. Just to illustrate. And let me say this too. The reason this lesson makes me nervous, I think it's necessary to preach. I recognize I may raise some questions. That's why Frank and Colby are here. (laughs) I'm going to raise the questions and they get to deal with them after I'm gone. No, I don't, you know, it's just the way it is. We got to be able to talk about these things because I've had to. And I have to where I am with 230 people with various backgrounds. Baptism. It's a tradition handed down by God, seems to me. It's preceded by faith and repentance and confession. I can find scripture for all of that. It's a burial. Requires enough water to be immersed. The word itself means an immersion. We're buried with Christ, Romans chapter 6. We're buried with him, Colossians chapter 2. Sprinkling of infants, that's not. I know that's the last bell. Let me just finish a couple of couple of things really quick. The traditions of men, sprinkling, baptized prior to being saved, doesn't have anything to do with washing away sins. I've got a track, and the track says baptism does not wash away sins. You know, that's clearly when a tradition of man, and you can take the scriptures and put them side by side and say, look, which one of these are you going to believe? But where are you going to be baptized? Sea, lake, ocean, river, pond, bathtub, pool, running water, baptistry, hot tub. Chinese fellow was being baptized. They took him out in the sea, and the fellow baptized him, and a a wave came up and buried them. And that Chinese brother came out of there praising the Lord. (laughs) I would have been perfectly content with that. Here's one been interesting. What about a baptistry? Does the person being baptized have to be in the water? I know a church that was going to do that, and they had so many people say, no, I think we need to have a baptistry where both of them get in the water, and they put in baptistry that both get in the water. The first time, I'm sorry, the first time I was baptized somebody at about 25 years old, we went to this group, church I was was preaching at on a a once-a-week basis, once-a-month basis. We took this couple there, brand new for them. It looked like a trough, you know, that you cattle drink out of. And I looked at that and realized it's going to be really tough for me to get in there with him. But I figured out how to get in there with him. And I knew how to baptize him, but I set him over here. I hit his head on the ladder. I thought about nearly drowned the guy. Nobody told me I didn't have to get in the thing. Stand outside, take him, put him down. I'm not sure they even knew that. Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, but I don't think Philip was immersed. It's okay. It's okay. 
So when things when we do things differently, by the way, I, I'm thankful for baptistries most of the time. Do you have, there was a, one place I, years ago, an elder, I was told when they built the building, he was just opposed to a baptistry. It was a waste of money. And about January, when they baptized somebody, he thought it was a really good idea. <laughs> All right, listen to me. You all come back, come in here while I'm still rambling. I hope I'm not rambling. Two things I want to tell you. I want to make sure I finish with this. If you're studying the scriptures and you come across something that says, are we doing this? That's okay. Be able to raise those questions. But if you're just deciding, well, let's just change things. That's not a good thing either. So it's, it's, it's not good to be rigid. We're not going to change anything. When somebody actually studies and say, well, maybe we can you need to look at this. And then the other side is, oh, we just need to change things to change things. That's not going to be helpful either. I really look forward to the rest of the week. I will tell you that I think this is needful to talk about and preach about. It will not be my favorite sermon from the week, but I want to be helpful. Appreciate you all. Thanks for listening.